Tonight on NJ Spotlight News. The concealed carry debate. Oral arguments begin today to try and overturn the state's strict public gun carry laws. Every parent ought to have the right to take their child to child to daycare, to take their child to school, and not have to worry about there being guns or dangerous weapons there. Also, a crime of genocide against Palestinians. More than 800 legal scholars calling the atrocities on the ground in the Middle East not only war crimes, but genocide. In my view, it's already a genocidal assault, but certainly uh, uh, the prospect of genocidal assault. And in, without a doubt, war crimes and crimes against humanity that are perpetrated in this Israeli assault on, uh, on Gaza. Plus, fighting the opioid crisis. New Jersey health officials looking overseas to find new strategies to combat the rise of fentanyl use here at home. So we know further criminalization does not work. That's how we got here in the first place, right? So we can't arrest our way out of this crisis. And New Jersey drivers, brace yourself for another toll hike. A 3% increase is slated to hit your wallet in the new year. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. Funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, and by the PSEG Foundation. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Wednesday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. New Jersey's top law enforcement official was in court today urging a panel of U.S. appeals judges to uphold the state's new concealed carry law. It limits guns from being carried in public and sensitive places like schools, libraries and restaurants. The measure is being challenged by gun rights groups who say the law is unconstitutional. Governor Murphy signed the regulation in 2022 following a U.S. Supreme Court decision that June striking down New York State's rules on carrying concealed handguns outside the home and was immediately confronted with lawsuits. The regulation has been blocked from being enforced and now it's up to the appeals court to decide its fate. Ted Goldberg has the latest. I am confident that as the court hears this argument, we are going to win. And the law, the law is going to remain in effect and we are going to be safer as a result of it. New Jersey AG Matt Placken is confident that the state's new gun law will be upheld in appeals court. Earlier this year, a New Jersey law was struck down that banned concealed carry in so-called sensitive places and added character witnesses to people trying to get a concealed carry permit. I am so proud to stand here today defending what I think is the most common sense thing we could be doing, which is ensuring that we don't have guns in sensitive spaces entirely consistent with what the Supreme Court has said. The Bruin decision radically changed how courts determine whether gun safety laws are constitutional. And that's one of the things that they're going to be discussing today. It declared that any laws restricting gun access had to be deeply, deeply rooted uh, in the historical tradition of America's gun regulations. And apparently a 100-year-old New York law was not historical enough. Last year's Bruin decision set by the Supreme Court struck down several states' laws restricting gun rights in public. In response, New Jersey State Assembly designated sensitive places where you can't legally carry. And attorneys representing New Jersey argued in appeals court today that there are historical precedents for these kinds of laws. Every parent ought to have the right to take their child to, child to daycare, to take their child to school, and not have to worry about there being guns or dangerous weapons there. Attorneys representing the plaintiffs argued that New Jersey's examples were either taken out of context or interpreted too broadly. Earlier this summer, when the third appeals court reinstated parts of the law, the Association of New Jersey Rifle and Pistol Clubs said despite this new ruling, ANJRPC will continue to aggressively defend gun owners' carry rights during every stage of this case. I read each and every provision in that law to make sure that we thought we could make it 
uh, one that would pass judicial review and scrutiny because we knew that it would. People think they're going to go out and play cowboy and, uh, and when they have a gun out there. They don't understand the enormity of the responsibility that you're taking when you carry a gun in public. Judges ask New Jersey's attorneys if they could ban unpopular speech in certain public spaces using the logic from the gun law. They also ask the plaintiff's attorneys if there was a problem with adding interviews to agreed upon background checks. A.G. Placken says he thinks New Jersey's laws won't be struck down by another court. Everything in this law that the governor signed and the legislature passed last year in the wake of the devastating Bruin decision is consistent with the Second Amendment, is consistent with the Supreme Court Bruin decision, and is consistent with our nation's practice going back centuries. The trial court got this one wrong. Let New Jersey's Bruin fix stand. This case will take weeks or months, giving gun rights and gun safety advocates plenty of time to continue arguing inside and outside of the courtroom. In Philadelphia, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. With the entire legislature on the ballot in less than two weeks, Democrats and Republicans are recommitting to their party's core policy issues. Senate Republicans recently released a GOP roadmap for a better New Jersey, laying out their legislative agenda if they were to take the majority in the November 7th elections. The issues range from parental rights to public safety and taxes. All of it, they say, is to reverse what the party believes is Governor Murphy's, quote, far left progressive Aggressive agenda. Here to talk about those priorities is Senate Minority Leader Anthony Bucco and Republican Budget Officer Declan O'Scanlan. Senators Bucco and O'Scanlan, uh, thanks for joining me. It's good to see you both. Senator Bucco, let me just start with you before we get into the roadmap. Um, I'm wondering if you want to address uh, Democrats have seized on it, Governor Murphy has seized on it, the comments that you made in a recent Star Ledger uh, editorial board talking about potentially uh, if the Republicans were to get a majority, um, cutting uh, extreme measures, as you said, such as late term abortions and taxpayer funding that could be on the chopping board when it comes to reproductive rights. Is it a fair claim that they're making uh, that you would go after uh, both abortion and reproductive rights in the state? No, it is not. Uh, I made it clear to the, to the Star-Ledger editorial board that here in New Jersey, our Supreme Court has said on two separate occasions that women have a, a constitutionally protected right to access. And I don't see any way to get around that. Um, what I did say is that Perhaps someone may put something up like that, but I couldn't even guarantee whether or not there'd be the votes to support it. Um, we have a diverse caucus. Some are pro-life, some are pro-life with exceptions, and some are pro-choice. So to even begin to speculate that that could happen is wrong. And it's just simply Governor Murphy and the Democrats trying to deflect away from the progressive policies that they've promoted that are having a direct impact on our residents in this state. And that's why we put out the roadmap uh, for New Jersey, for a better New Jersey. Let me just say on that for one moment, would you keep in place current funding or would that be an area where you might look to, as is laid out in these priorities, cut back on some of the government spending? Well, look, like I said before, it's very difficult when it comes to this issue. This is uh, issues that's personal to people. And quite frankly, if we're able to catch lightning in the bottle and get a majority, it'll be by a slim margin. Senator Scanlon, uh, uh, as uh, mentioned, as the Republican budget officer, what do you see as the main priorities, uh, although as Senator Bucco alluded to, calling it lightning in the bottle, catching lightning in a bottle, um, for your caucus, if you were to flip uh, some seats come November? Well, certainly, you know, spending and taxes are always the top of everybody's list. And Republicans have put out uh, a specific roadmap in those areas. There's issue after issue where Democrats have failed. And I believe strongly that there's a real appetite out there on, on behalf of New Jersey voters to give Republicans a chance at leadership. What uh, specifically, I really think we stand Senator? A shot at that. Yeah, when you talk about radical positions that Democrats have taken, what specifically are you pointing to? Well, let's well, talk think about. Uh, let's talk about crime. Uh, when we passed uh, marijuana legalization, which Democrats completely destroyed, 
uh, that, that reform. There was a way to do it right. But they included uh, handcuffing of our police. This crime spree has happened for a reason. It's because of a relaxation of pursuit rules uh, and other soft on crime positions that the Democrats have enacted while they've been in control over this past 20 years, particularly the last few. Uh, Senator Buchel, let me just come back to you quickly. Uh, crime spending, what are the other key priorities, key issues that you see um, as needed to be addressed? I think the erosion of parental rights and uh, parents' right to control uh, their children's education and information sharing with the schools. Uh, you know, there's it, it's no secret that a child gets a best education when the parents and the teachers are communicating. Uh, this administration has made it a project to try to interfere uh, in that process. I think that's dead wrong. And, uh, and when you also look at the extreme energy master plan, right, with these windmills that they're talking about right off of our coast, we still have whales washing up on the beaches dead. Uh, you know, you're, you're telling folks now that by 2035, they're gonna have to buy an electric vehicle. And it's important to note that many of the financial problems that this state faces are a direct result of these progressive policies. All of these things have a direct impact on people's lives, and they all have a direct impact on their pocketbooks. And that's why New Jersey is becoming more and more and more unaffordable and why inflation is eating away at folks' uh, home income. Senators Bucco and O'Scanlan uh, laying out their legislative priorities uh, if their caucus gains a, ma a majority on November 7th. Senators, thank you so much. Thanks, Brown. Appreciate thank it. Well, it took 21 days and four Republican nominees, but Congress has a new Speaker of the House tonight. Conservative Louisiana Representative Mike Johnson was elected today with 220 votes and unanimous GOP support behind him. It's a major leadership change that comes three weeks after the historic ouster of former Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Johnson serves as the House GOP Conference Vice Chairman and on the Judiciary and Armed Services Committees. He's also a vocal supporter of former President Donald Trump and was a key congressional player in Trump's failed efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. The 51-year-old is an attorney with a focus on constitutional law who also served in the Louisiana State Legislature and as a conservative talk radio host. Johnson secured the gavel after a nomination late last night, capping off a chaotic string of days that saw Republicans choosing other nominees only for them to drop out from lack of support. In his first address to the House today, Johnson said he'll bring a bill to the floor in support of Israel. The House has been paralyzed throughout the conflict without a leader of the chamber. Several hundred New Jersey Air National Guard members from Atlantic City have been deployed to the Middle East, along with a squadron of F-16 Falcon fighter jets to support U.S. forces in the region as the Israel-Hamas conflict escalates. A spokesperson for the Israeli military today said forces are preparing for the, quote, next stage of war, with strikes on Gaza strengthening to target what it refers to as Hamas terror infrastructure, adding a top priority is a eliminating senior Hamas commanders. That statement comes as President Biden today offered some of his strongest support yet for Israel, saying Israel has the right and responsibility to respond to the slaughter of their people, referring to the October 7th attacks by Hamas that killed 1,400 Israelis. Palestinian officials estimate the death toll at more than 6,500, though President Biden today said he, quote, didn't have confidence in that data. And Gaza officials say of the Palestinians who've been killed, killed in the bombings, more than 2,000 are children. The nature of Israel's counterattack now has a growing number of scholars accusing the military of perpetrating crimes of genocide. More than 800 international law and genocide scholars have signed on to a public statement arguing Gaza is being subjected to a genocidal siege and destructive assault. Among them is Stockton University professor Roz Siegel. He's an Israeli historian and endowed professor in the study of modern genocide, and he joins me now. Professor, thank you so much for your time. You say and you have written that uh, this is intent to commit genocide on the part of Israel's military. Uh, why do you make that argument? 
thank you for having me uh, today. I uh, uh, make this argument because uh, we're seeing, uh, I think we're uh, seeing a special intent to destroy that's required according to the UN Genocide Convention uh, from 1948. Uh, and we're seeing this in, uh, we've seen this uh, since uh, 7th of October in very explicit uh, statements by Israel leaders, by army officers, by the Israeli president who referred to all the Palestinians in Gaza um, as responsible for the Hamas uh, attack on 7th of October. We've seen this in uh, uh, Israeli defense minister's uh, uh, proclamation of a complete siege. We've seen this in politicians uh, calling, for example, for a second Nakba, referring to the uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in the 1948 war and the creation of the state of uh, Israel. Is that is that not a valid counterattack, given the reports uh, both of just Hamas's attack in general and the specifics of how the attacks were carried out on civilians uh, and hostages? I want to make it clear that I think that the Hamas attack was a horrendous uh, uh, mass murder, a war crime, and and that constituted as well crimes against uh, uh, humanity. Uh, I wrote yesterday that uh, I'm, I also called for uh, eventually for putting the planners and the perpetrators uh, on trial. Um, so I want to make it very clear what I think about the Hamas attack on 7th of October. That, however, in no way justifies or excuses the retaliatory genocidal assault that we're seeing on Gaza. So no, the, the answer to your question is no. That's not an appropriate uh, uh, response. I'm curious your take on this because it's been framed as and called, and, and rightfully so, uh, the most uh, deadly day for Jews since the Holocaust. But you've spoken extensively about this um, idea of weaponizing Holocaust memory. What do you mean by that? And uh, what are the dangers, as you write, um, about that context? So that's why I think we're seeing the explicit language, because uh, uh, the Hamas attack and actually in various uh, explicit or implicit ways, Palestinians more broadly are now framed as Nazis. Um, and Israelis are framed as powerless uh, Jews, whereas we're talking here about a very powerful state with a powerful army backed by all the Western uh, powers. And we're talking about a stateless people, Palestinians, under decades of Israeli settler colonial rule, military occupation, siege, apartheid policies. All this is, is well documented. The context of the attack on 7th of October by Hamas, which, as I said, is a horrendous mass murder, war crime and crimes against humanity, is very different than the context of the attack against Jews during the Holocaust. And weaponizing the Holocaust, right, in order to actually justify this retaliatory genocidal assault that we're now seeing on Gaza. Again, 19 days of bombings of a civilian population, right, uh, um, is a very, is, is, is horrendous in itself, this weaponization of the Holocaust and uh, a completely inappropriate as a, as a Holocaust and genocide study scholar. I think that the, I can't speak in the name of, uh, uh, you know, more than 800 uh, people who signed the statement. I think that all of them, including the Holocaust and genocide study scholars among them, there's you know, quite a few and some very influential uh, scholars in the field are all very concerned um, about uh, uh, what in my view is already a genocidal assault, but certainly uh, uh, the prospect of genocidal assault. And then without a doubt, war crimes and crimes against humanity that are perpetrated in this Israeli assault on, uh, on Gaza, that's for sure. Raz Segal is an Israeli Holocaust scholar and associate professor at Stockton University. Raz, thank you so much. Thank you. And make sure to tune in tomorrow night for Chatbox with David Cruz. David will talk about the Israel-Hamas conflict in an exclusive interview with New Jersey's embattled senior Senator Bob Menendez. And of course, get his reaction to the federal corruption allegations he's facing. That's tomorrow night at 6 p.m. on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel and right here on NJ Spotlight News. The overdose crisis is becoming even more challenging to solve. The epidemic is now being fueled by the rise of fentanyl use, with more than 1,800 residents' lives claimed by drug overdose this year alone. Public health experts today met to share solutions, including replacing criminal punishments with better public health care and harm reduction strategies. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan was there. When the police come, the addict runs. 
Recovering addict James Brown told a symposium on solving New Jersey's opioid overdose crisis that in his 40 years experiencing the so-called war on drugs in Patterson, he learned a valuable lesson about law enforcement. It didn't help him. Every time I dealt with the police, I went to jail. Every time I went to the police, they checked my name for warrants. Every time I went to the police, they wanted to pat me down to see if I had some drugs. So we know further criminalization does not work. That's how we got here in the first place, right? So we can't arrest our way out of this crisis. And folks at this gathering agree it's still a crisis. In 2012, New Jersey logged about 1,200 drug overdose deaths, and the numbers climbed steadily, peaking at more than 3,100 a couple years ago. It's decreased slightly since, but fentanyl remains a deadly problem, prompting calls to toughen legal penalties. At the same time, New Jersey's also opening new harm reduction centers to offer needle exchanges, addiction treatment, and referrals in 14 of 21 counties. New Jersey is simultaneously attempting two things at once, kind of to no avail, right? On one hand, we're like, criminalize, 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 tough on crime, law and order. On the other hand, we're saying public health, harm reduction, compassion. The ACLU's and Amy Kachalia says tougher laws simply drive up incarceration rates, particularly for people of color, and take them out of the health care system. She notes the number one parole violation in New Jersey is a positive drug test. Drugs and the use of drugs are used as a tool, right, to deny people opportunity and in many cases to criminalize them and then throw them away, to make them not worthy of compassion and resources. Over the next decade, New Jersey slated to receive more than a billion dollars in opioid settlement money, and advocates here recommend that it not be spent on policing, but rather invested in communities hardest hit by the war on drugs. It really comes down to, do people need to be punished in order to save their life or not? Advocate Tira Hurst helped pass Oregon's harm reduction treatment program that focuses more on treatment than punishment. She calls the angry pushback soul-crushing because folks don't see immediate positive results. Nuno Capaz says it took time for police to adjust in Portugal after his nation decriminalized drugs. One of the unintended consequences of decriminalizing is that police officers no longer target drug users because for them it's just paperwork. He's with Portugal's Health Dissuasion Commission, which offers drug users a path to treatment. Like in the U.S., funding for programs mirrors levels of public concern, so, but he warns. All, we didn't solve the problem, okay? It's not solvable. Drug-related issues, uh, problematic usage of substances, it will always be around, okay? So we didn't solve the problem. It's not done with. We are managing the problem as we go along. And while many New Jersey residents still face significant bills for drug treatment programs, folks in Portugal can count on universal health care. But Brown told the crowd said, if harm works? reduction's available... I tell you that harm reduction works. I'm, I'm, I'm down with that. With harm reduction, there comes some love. He says treatment programs need to meet the people where they're at. In Ewing, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. In our Spotlight on Business report, Democrats are leaning on Governor Murphy to block a planned toll hike for the Garden State Parkway and Turnpike. Drivers would face a 3% spike in tolls starting January 1st under a plan approved this week by Turnpike Authority commissioners. The panel unanimously voted in favor of a more than $2.6 billion budget for next year. That's a $100 million increase over the authority's current budget and said they'll need to raise tolls to help pay for it. Commissioners cited the need for more maintenance and engineering staff to work on a massive turnpike widening project, along with inflation and global supply chain pressures. But Democrats who control the legislature and are staring down the upcoming statewide election are asking Governor Murphy to veto the minutes from Tuesday's Turnpike Authority meeting, saying New Jersey families are already struggling financially due to rising costs from inflation. New Jersey's chapter of the National Motorists Association is backing that request and called out the authority for three consecutive years of toll hikes. Turning now to Wall Street, stocks took a tumble to start the day. Here's how markets closed. 
support for the business report provided by the New Jersey Tourism Industry Association. NJTIA will host their New Jersey Conference on Tourism November 30th through December 1st at Resorts Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City. NJTIA.org for event information. And that does it for us tonight. But don't forget to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Life is unpredictable. Health insurance shouldn't be. For over 90 years, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey has provided quality, affordable health plans to New Jersey residents. We have served generations of New Jersey families and businesses and are committed to driving innovations that put you at the heart of everything we do. Our members are our neighbors, our friends, and our families. We're here when you need us most. Horizon, proud to be New Jersey. I'm very grateful that I'm still here. That's me and my daughter when we went to celebrate our first anniversary. With a new kidney, I have strength. They gave me a new lease on life. I'm still going everywhere and exploring new places. Nobody thought I was going to be here. Nobody. And I look forward to getting older with my wife. That's possible now. We're transforming lives through innovative kidney treatments, living donor programs, and world-renowned care at two of New Jersey's premier hospitals. They gave me my normal life back. It's a blessing. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together.